How about prayer requests or any updates to prayer requests? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Robert? We will still keep Richard on there. I wanted to make sure it looks like I'm not going to. Yes, ma'am. Tommy asked me this morning about Lisa, and she had had her test last week, and it was painful, and they found out nothing. And so, once again, that's just really discouraging. Yeah. So, I just continue to pray that somehow we're going to be able to get discernment about what to do and what not to do to help her out. Well, let me go to the Robert, hear me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we we thank that we we thank you that we have the opportunity to voice our prayer request directly to you. You provided us with that ability, Lord. We thank you. Um, and Lord, we pray for these on our prayer list, those suffering and hurting. Uh, we pray, Lord, for a good vacation Bible school for the children here at, at Cross Church uh, for a good experience to hear more about you, Lord. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, again, welcome to uh, Jerry and Janeth, and uh, so glad you guys are with us today, and uh, we are in the book of 2 Thessalonians this morning, going to be in chapter 2 and 3, and I want to begin by asking you all a question, and that is, uh, what are some things you would say make for a bad day? Can anybody think of something that makes for a bad day? Something happens to our kids. Okay. What makes up for a bad day? What's that? A bad, a bad day. day. Uh, you didn't eat pretty good last night. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Spending too much time on the tarmac, yes. That. Your alarm clock didn't go off. Oh, yes. The alarm clock didn't go off, and it just goes downhill from there kind of thing. Yeah, we've all we've all been there. So uh, you may have had the experience at one time or another where maybe you were having a bad day, or maybe you were anticipating a bad day. And out of the blue, surprise to you, someone maybe sends you a text message or a phone call and said, you know, I was just thinking about you. And uh, once you know, I was praying for you. And uh, boy, that's that's a lift lift you up. Is there a problem with them, or is it okay? Um, I don't know if they can hear or not. Will, can you all hear? Yes. They're, okay. That's that's the main thing they can hear. So I don't we're getting, think you we're getting strange us. messages on the on on this side of it. So I don't know what that's about today. We've tried changed anything and everything but still getting some interesting messages but uh, what I would ask you this question speaking of prayer and that's what our lesson title is about today praying um, how does knowing someone is praying for you impact you you know they're praying for you how does that impact you makes me feel like they love me Okay. You don't feel so all alone. All right. Not, not walking this by yourself. We have a nephew that lives in Florida, and he's been going through some really hard times. He doesn't know the Lord. And uh, we, we pray with him, and he stays in co contact with us, and we tell him we're praying for him. And it, 
it's amazing. He cries sometimes and he says, I, I know, I feel it. So when you tell someone that doesn't know the Lord that you're praying for them, we really don't know what that feels like, but but we kind of experienced that with my nephew. He didn't have anybody else but us. Mm -hmm. And so he's he's he feels it. Okay. Some wonderful things happened to him when he was at rock bottom and he said it's because still, I think it's because you're still, they still can't hear us. Praise the Lord. Hello. I love the way they say it in Taiwan when they talk about someone who is not a Christian. They'll they always put this expression in front of it. Not yet a Christian. They don't just say he's not a Christian. He's not yet a Christian. <laughs> and so there's there's an element of hope there. I, well, I don't know how we could incorporate that, but you know that's that's a that's a wonderful perspective, and um, you know. I have to tell you something personal this morning, uh, share kind of a personal piece as we're talking about this lesson. In 2011, we'd come back to the States in 2004 from overseas to give support to our parents who were dealing with various issues at that time. And in just under an eight year window, those three parents went to be with the Lord. But um, my mother was the last one and uh, after her death, we really felt the Lord wanted us to go back overseas again. But the problem was we were 64 years old at that time. The IMB doesn't have a practice typically of appointing 64-year-old people to go back full-time to the field, okay? And so, but I, I had written a letter to uh, an, e an email to a co-worker that we had known in Taiwan, and he was... Uh, kind of like a team leader in Taiwan, and asking him about places of service, you know, with, he knew us, and knew our language, what we did, what language you knew, and all that kind of stuff. Basically, I still have that email, <laughs> I keep a lot of my email, and uh, I found it the other day, and he basically said, I don't know of any job possibilities right now. And that was the last I heard from him. And I'm gonna tell you the rest of the story in just a minute. Um, but that's the first part. And the thing, the thing we see here in chapter 2, you know, Paul has already told these Thessalonian believers repeatedly how much he appreciates them because they were stickers, they were spreading the good news, it was going out from them to other people, it was getting all over their province, it was extending to, to the nation, and um, he, had, he had taught them in a very brief period of time when they had come to Christ, when he and his team were in Thessalonica, then they unexpectedly and rapidly had to leave the city because of, of uh, the danger that was presenting and persecution and, and just all kinds of stuff that was going on. But um, he, had, he, had a, he had a concern for these people, even though they were separated. And he had already, he taught them already. And back in the, in the, in the first book, first letter, first Thessalonians, Chapter 4 in particular, we saw where he talked about the second coming. Gave them a clear understanding about the return of Christ and, and what they needed to be focused on because they were, there were people who were false teachers that were trying to mislead them and confuse them and this kind of thing. And But, you know, in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, he says, you know, when he appears, all people who are his children are going to join him. doesn't matter if they're alive at the moment or if they've already died. They will be resurrected from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every generation. And that includes you and me. We're, we're going to have this incredible reunion. And so he, he stresses that to them. And in, in the second letter, there's, there are the questions that are addressed. But he goes back again and, and reaffirms truth about the return of Christ and there were some that were trying to say, well, you know, he's about to come. You know, you, you guys might as well just stop what you're doing. This thing of following Jesus. He's about to come, and you're not going to be a part of that anyway. All these things that they were confusing them with. But he reminds them of a couple of things. That there is what's known as an apostasy. Those who are going to reject the Lord. And they're going to be people that will turn their back. They've heard the gospel. They don't want to have any part of it. And, and there's going to be 
judgment. Last Sunday we talked about, and Will gave us a great introduction to the understanding about the man of lawlessness, this representative of, the, of Satan. And, um, you know, if it were not for God restraining, you know, it would have happened much worse earlier. But the ultimate judgment is going to come. But Paul, through all of this, has a continuing prayer focus for these believers. He prayed that they would stand firm that they would not give way, that they'd be true to the end. He prayed that they would continue to embrace the truth. And he asks them to pray for him and his team. And that's what we're really going to dive into this morning. And so let's, let's look at the lesson. We're going to take it in four, four bits here. Chapter 2, verse 13 to 15 the first part, and Wallace is going to read that if you'll listen carefully and read along in your scripture. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken words or by our letter. So he goes on here in this passage, and, and it says, We ought always to give thanks for you. He's, he's grateful for these believers. Once again, he calls them brothers. There is not just, I'm the apostle, you're the follower. No, I'm your brother. Don't forget that. I'm your brother. And that, that's, that's one of the earmarks of, of people who lead is that they are also, you know, we're, we're, in, this, we're in this journey together. We're, we're equal. You know, yes, I have an assignment, I have a calling, but we're in this together. This is Paul's affirmation to these believers. And so, this relationship, he wants to know he's praying for them. He's supporting them. Okay, back to that personal story. Amen. Huh? So I contacted Mike Jim Graham and asked him about the other, other places of service. And in 2012, something happened. In fact, it was either on this day or tomorrow. I don't remember if it was the 21st, I mean the 22nd or the 23rd. I don't remember what day it was. And I want to show you a video of what took place in that on that day. One conversation since it's currently in use. You see it up there, honey? Yes, okay. I'm the Zoom. And that's, that's that Zoom should... is below, but the civilization's up above. God is faithful. Faithful is he called us and were appointed to go to East Asia 29 years ago this week. Faithful over the last seven years as we return to care for aging parents in their last years of life. Today, he is again faithful, leading and providing for our return to East Asia. Okay, so you got the idea. Anyway, that was the reappointment service, and they asked us to share in 30 seconds. I'm not you know, able to hear it. And uh, so that's what we did. And what was interesting, that was 2012, but going back, as Donna said, 29 years ago, same week. Well, guess what happened? I tried this past week, Wednesday until yesterday. We were with a group of over 700 retired emeritus International Mission Board missionaries in Orlando, Florida. And man, was it fantastic to see so many friends in spite of the return trip on the tarmac and the airport. I mean, that, that's just kind of phasing to think about the wonderful week that we had. And uh, when we went back to Taiwan in 2012, there was Jim Graham. And do you know, for probably a year after we arrived on the field, every time 
we saw Jim. We'd go up to Taipei where he was living, see him up there, go to some other meeting, some other gathering. He'd come down to our city. Every time Jim saw us, it is so good to have you guys here. I am so happy to see you. He kept saying it over and over and over again. I said, okay, thank you, Jim. <laughs> thank you, Jim. But, you know, as I've reflected on that, I know that Jim, that he prayed for us. And Paul, as a brother, saying, I'm praying for you. And he was sticking with them. He was thankful, as it says here in this passage, he was thankful to God. Because God's the one that chooses. God's the one who saves. It's his grace. He's the one that makes the salvation a possible and a real experience. He was grateful because God is the one who's continuing to change them. Sanctification by the Spirit. Because they had a belief. They believed the truth. They didn't just hear it. They believed, they accepted, and they trusted the Lord. And so this is what caused him to be grateful. They were called through the gospel. And notice also that it says in this passage, they would obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is an, an eternal significance to your faith in Jesus Christ, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you, you take that phrase right there and you set it alongside of a, of a statement that Paul made in the third chapter of the book of Romans, and he said this, those who fall short of the glory of God. But in that same chapter, he says, he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on in verse 15 in this passage, so then brothers, stand firm, hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So salvation and future glory that's out there waiting, <clears throat> giving thanks for those things along with the responsibilities that they had for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he makes an interesting statement here in this passage. In verse 15, it says, stand firm and hold to the traditions. Now, I don't know how you think about that word, tradition. Sometimes, you know, I think we probably would maybe rightfully have a negative thought about people <clears throat> clinging to traditions. You know, we want to make sure that we're cl clinging to God's truth, not just a tradition. But when he says to them, hold to the traditions, he's talking about the foundational teaching of Jesus Christ. The foundational doctrine of what Jesus gave to us through his teaching. That's what he's talking about, is the tradition. The original language stresses that particular reality. And so, what Jesus gave to us, and what we are passing along to you, hold to that tradition, is what he's saying to them. These are the things, these are the elements that are essential for our salvation. So this is the admonition to Paul, from Paul to these believers as he's praying for them. But let's continue in verse 16 and verse 17, if you'll follow in your copy. And let's see. Kelvin, is that your passage? Mm -hmm. Verses 16 and 17, if you'll follow along as Kelvin reads. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort Comfort your hearts, establish them in every good work and word. How do you look at the words there in verse 16? He says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that sound like? What does that sound like? Mm -hmm. 
does that sound like? Sounds like a benediction, a <laughs> which is which is which is a prayer. Okay. Once again, this is this is the content of his prayer, and so he's he's giving them them teaching. He's talking about holding on to the traditions, the the teaching, the doctrine, the truth passed down to us through Jesus Christ, and then he follows that up. May the our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. So he's asking God to bless them. So they need strength. They need willpower in order to stand up against persecution, but they also what? They need God's blessing. They need his presence, his working in their lives. And notice it's, it's also interesting in that, in that 16th verse that he makes the specific distinction there. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, okay? So... The Father and the Son, they are working in harmony, okay? Listen to what it says elsewhere. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Listen to this. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The love of God, okay? So this is the idea here. May our Lord Jesus Christ, he's the one who died for us. May God, the Father, he is the one who loves us. So there's the correlation, the connection, the inseparable tie between God the Father, God the Son, God's love, the sacrifice of his Son for us. Notice also that it says in, in this passage, in verse 16, what God has done and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. So the hope, the comfort that we have in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ is secure. It is definite. It is not, I hope it's so, I pray that it's so. No, it's definite. It is secure. What did Jesus say? The last thing that Jesus said when he died on the cross, we have his last words. What was the very last thing that he said? It was actually only one word. Oh, it's translated with several words in English. He said the word in Greek. It is finished. Died. What was the last word he said? He said, do you remember? <clears throat> it is finished. It's done. It is finished. You can't he has paid the price for us. What does religion do for a person? Religion, well, if you follow this, uh, these guidelines, you'll be good. Ah, if you're a good enough person, you should be all right. Yeah, that's what religion does. Religion's like putting a first coat of paint on the walls. Good. And no undercoat either. <laughs> Exactly. It's, 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 it's not adequate. It's not, it's, it, it's not dealing with the reality of what we uh, need that Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. It is finished. It is done. It is secure. And so Paul, again, is highlighting the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the true hope that we have in him. So verse 17 Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. This is what God's going to do. He's praying that God will do that in their hearts to comfort them. Establish them in every good work, everything that they do, that, that it will last, that it will have impact, that there will be penetration of the gospel flowing in, out of their lives into the lives of other people. And so, you know, something else about that, reunion this past week they had an incredible uh staff and by the way we we got to stay in a really nice hotel resort because nicer than nice. yeah nicer than nice <laughs> that we would never probably ever go to again for a reunion event like this and the whole reason was because we were told that they gave an incredible financially an incredible deal because guess what, COVID. 
They haven't had business. They've been hurting. And, you know, the staff there, it didn't matter if it was the people that cleaned the rooms, the people at the front desk, the people that served at the table, the people that showed you, yeah, you need to go down this way. They were so kind. I don't know how many of them were believers. But we heard several people say this. The people on the staff said, we've never had a group like you guys. And what they were talking about was not how great these missionaries are, but there was an external display of God's transformational work in the life of people that influenced the way they impacted other people. And they just, they, they were blown away by it. They, they saw the difference of Christ in the lives of people. And, um, you know, Paul is praying that way for these believers, that there will be this, there's, we know there's an internal reality because Christ is in you. We want him to be displayed and in every good work, everything that you do, that he is being displayed. Let's, let's look on further into chapter 3, the first two verses, and who has chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the little reading. Okay, Irma's going to read that for us if you'll follow along. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith. So, isn't it interesting? Paul was first of all saying, we've been praying for you. These, these are my prayers for you. But he also says, guys, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for our team. This is, you know, this is the way we're going to support, love, and cheer, and be there for each other. Hopefully, that's an ongoing habit for all of us that we uh, you know that we pray for each other that we pray for our church family that we pray for our pastor our leadership that we pray for family and all the people around us well that takes up a lot of time to do all that <laughs> but I hope that's what we're engaged in and the idea here when he says, pray for us. You know, sometimes one language can't give all the detail of another language. Well, in the original language, I'm not a Greek student, okay? I'm not like Pastor Chris. I, I can't preach from the Greek New Testament or the Hebrew. I can't do any of that. But the scholars tell us, Greek scholars, that when he says, pray for us, that the Greek gives the idea that this is ongoing. It's not just a quick flash, you know, and then it's done. But there is a continuation that just keeps on and keeps on. It's not a one time. It's not an occasional event. It's a repetitive thing. There's ongoing prayer, ongoing prayer for these believers in Christ. And look at what, what he says that, that he is asking that they pray for him. First, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead. Okay. We know what speed ahead is. We see that all the time on 820 and 935. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about, speed ahead. What, is, what does it mean here when he says uh, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead? What in the world does that mean? Advance. Spread rapidly is what this translation says. Okay, to spread rapidly. So the idea, once again, being a continual forward movement. You know, it's not just a, you know, shot in the dark, but there is a continuing advance of the gospel. This was Paul's prayer, asking them to pray for him and for the team, Silas, Timothy, that, you know, we can keep on keeping on, that the gospel will go forward. And... Um, 
like I told Jerry and Janet this morning, we're talking about our class name, Legacy. And I said, oh, yeah, we're just getting started. That's what legacy means. We're just getting started. It's not we're about to finish. No, we're just getting started. And that's, that's what Paul is saying. You know, I don't, I don't know how old he was. He's probably legacy by the time, you know, this letter is being written. But he said, you know, just, okay, that the gospel is going to speed ahead. And that we want to see continual movement of the gospel. And then he says also, pray that, that, that the gospel will what? Be honored. And be honored as happened among you. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that it be honored? It's up there at the Olympics at the very top. I mean, you got number one. <laughs> okay. So we want, when we share the gospel, we want, want it to be honored. People to take it seriously. Yeah, I know you're praying for me. <laughs> I know you are. Not there yet, but I know you're. I, I sense it. I can tell you're praying, and so this is what this is what Paul is hoping that there would be a realization as they're out there sharing and, and serving the Lord that people say this is this is something we need to pay attention to. This is this is a valid, real, relevant, timely message we need to pay attention to. So that's what he's praying that it would be honored, asking them to pray, that it'll get people's attention. And then he goes on to say, as it happened among you. Just remember what happened to you. How you guys, you know, you're taking it. You're, you, you didn't just say, oh, it's so good to believe in Jesus. And then I sit down and go back to sleep. No. It's so good to believe in Jesus. And I got to tell these other folks. I got to reach out to these other folks. And a second thing, another thing he, he asked them to pray in verse 2. And that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Paul knew what persecution was. Paul knew what it was to suffer for the gospel. He knew that the Thessalonian believers understood what that was about. They had already experienced persecution. But he's just saying, you know, it's not, it's not a prayer, I hope I never go through persecution again. No. What he's saying is that that they're not going to stop this moving forward of the gospel, but that it's going to be able to continue, that more and more people will have a chance to hear the good news. Paul knew the cost because he closes out that verse, for not all have faith. That is an unfortunate reality. Not everybody is going to believe. Paul had a willingness to suffer and the Thessalonian believers knew that. And he was willing to do it. It's like, it's like there was a positive... Can, can you think of this being... Putting these two words together? There was a positive stubbornness. <laughs> we don't like to be around stubbornness, do we? But Paul had a positive stubbornness. Just, just pray that persecution not going to slow us down. We're going to continue on, continue to share. And you know, I just, I just wonder, some of these folks that are out there persecuting Christians, do they know, really know what they're doing? They think they're, they're squelching the movement of the gospel. But how many times has it happened throughout history that when God's people are persecuted, the gospel, it's like throwing fire on gas, gasoline on a fire. That's, that's, that's what it's like. It just God is going to come in and move in, in powerful ways. I think the example in the Ukraine is, is uh, evidence of that. Absolutely. Uh, Christians have come to the forefront. Absolutely. In a big way. Yeah, very definitely. Keep praying. And notice the last three verses, verse 3, 4, and 5. And I believe Javier is going to read those verses for us. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So the last phrase of verse 2 was, 
for not all have faith, the first phrase of verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. God is faithful. We're going to encounter inconsistency. We're going to encounter people that will consistently let you down. We're going to encounter people that may even betray you. But the scripture is saying here, our Lord can be trusted regardless. Never a time. I appreciated Stu's message so much this morning. And like Habakkuk calling out, crying out from the dugout to the umpire. Yeah, you, like, you, like you pointed out, that's what his prayer was like to God. But the ultimate thing that God is saying here, Paul is saying, and what Habakkuk is coming to realize, but God, the Lord, is faithful. What about God's faithfulness? What does it look like? Well, he says it's going to be demonstrated in at least two ways. One thing he says here, he will establish you. He will establish you. The relationship you have with him is firmly in place. He will establish you. You will be able to withstand the attacks that come your way. Secondly, what does it say? And guard you, verse 3, against the evil one. He will do that. He will guard you against the evil one. And the evil one here, yeah, it includes Satan. But it includes also, it's, it's even including human opposition that is in some kind of a spiritual or supernatural attack that may emerge. Because all of these kinds of obstacles and the battles that the Thessalonian believers were dealing with, they're, they're real. They're things that we face as, what, as well. And so whether the evil attacks come from people or the evil works of Satan, we can rest assured none of it is bigger than God. He is supreme. So in verse 4 he says, And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. Don't you like that old hymn? Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Christians, our faithfulness rests on God's faithfulness. Christian's faithfulness grows through obedience. And so he says, finally in verse 5, May the Lord, once again, that prayer format, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. You know what we need to be overwhelmed by? <laughs> God's love. His love is greater his love is stronger, overwhelmed by his love. Because it, his love enables us to love one another. Paul asked them to, that the Lord would direct their hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. What is this about? What is the steadfastness of Christ about? He's a sticker. Okay. He never gives up. He's always. Never, never breaks his promises. Amen. He never breaks his promises. May I read something? Yes. I just got this email this week. Okay. With little family that are missionaries. I can't really tell you where. But a village pastor was going into the Elm jungle. He just calls them the Elm people. 
over here and some passionate, he's a local pastor. He, some passionate young people found out about his work and raised commotion over his efforts. He's been jailed three times and been beaten, and this time had his life threatened. They were gonna kill him. His response was not natural. You'll have to kill me then. As his attackers moved for action to do that, they were immobilized beyond anything that seemed <laughs> natural. Once they regained the ability to move, they actually turned and ran wow. in the opposite direction in fear as they realized the supernatural power of God at work. This pastor was the same one that was praying for God to send someone to equip and help him reach the area. We were prompted by a friend to go check on this tribe and upon checking on it, found out that this pastor had been praying for us. So the prayer among the Christian people who else but God through prayer could have immobilized yeah. those people mm -hmm. and caused them to, to flee and spare that pastor's life. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Robert. Beautiful testimony. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I could just share. Now, yeah. I'm going to come up there. Okay. I want, I want Will and Dar Darlene to hear this. Okay. This is from this week while we're there. Get up. Uh, Robert already mentioned to you that we went back for a second time, we were reappointed. And when we were reappointed by the IMB, uh, they asked us instead of staying in Taiwan, where we had originally been for all those years, to go into Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines. And so we did that. And let me tell you, some of the greatest ministry that we had ever experienced, God just absolutely tore down walls and just, and is still doing great work there. Well, the last place that we were trying to target was the Philippines and God had provided a person uh, there in the Philippines and just one of those God things where we met up with him. The only person that we knew in the Philippines who was Hokkien, who had a heart because China now has had a wave of people who have moved from that the province of the Fukien province to go into the Philippines. This is the second wave. It happened years ago and now it's happening again. Nobody targeting them really. And so Tony Ong, he has. Well, uh, Will and Darlene, we sit down at breakfast. Uh, you know, you, you, seven to eight hundred people, you don't know who you can sit with. You just see somebody and you sit down and start talking. And so this couple turns to us and said, oh, you're in Texas. Do you happen to know Will and Darlene? And so we said, well, actually, he's a co-teacher with Robert in our, uh, our class. Oh, my goodness. They said, this says, you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, uh, Kara and Don Wood. I won't forget that name because he said, I'm not a forest, I'm just one stick. So <laughs> that helped me, helped me to remember that name. Any, anyway, so he starts talking to us and we said, oh, so you were in the Philippines with him? He says, yes, we were. We're very good friends. We do woodwork. I do woodwork just like Will does. We'd love to get together. They come see us. We have this great experience. He said, so what did you do? So we told him and he said, oh, I have hook in friends in the Philippines. And he said, ever since we left and before, I have been praying for the Hokkien people to come to Christ in the Philippines. Okay, now we had no idea about that. He said, I know who Tony Ong is, Pastor Tony Ong. He said, I know who he is. So when I get back to the hotel, I write Tony on Facebook. There are big Facebook users out there. And so I write Tony and I said, hey, Tony, we saw these missionaries and just wanted you to know they've been praying uh, for you. And of course, he knows we pray for him all the time. Well, he writes back and he said, that is awesome. He said, um, I just want you to know we're about ready to start a new church, a new Hokkien church. He's by himself starting this, but he's training pastors in Hokkien to do this ministry. And I thought, we didn't know. That's all about prayer. And Robert's talking this morning about prayer. And I thought, only God, could, out of seven to 800 people, that God would have us sit by them. And it just so happened that they happened to know Will and Darlene and then we get back to Tony, and Tony says, pray for me that I'll have more pre preaching opportunities. And so here it goes. It's all about prayer. So God is so good, and he's so great, and we had no idea. And we had wanted to go back there. We already had a training event planned to go to the Philippines, and that was when Robert was diagnosed with cancer. There's a side of you that says, well, it's all over. But God's the one who's the one who makes things happen. And so we're just so grateful. So I thought, I got to tell that testimony. Yeah. 
Well, so these guys were continuing on in the steadfastness of Christ. Uh, they, they had struggles. They had challenges. They were encountered by false teachers, persecution, but they were continuing on. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, at the last part of this uh, lesson material in your, in your student study guide, there were some statements on the board and kind of kind of talking to us about um, our our prayer life and the way that we pray and uh, it says we can express thankfulness to God for the salvation of others prayer is a form of encouragement to others believers are wise to invite others, other believers, to pray for and with them. And God is capable. capable. I keep reading all right. God is capable of helping believers <laughs> honor and remain faithful to Him. Any any thoughts from the scripture we've looked at or these statements here that are kind of speaking to us about our our prayer life and the way we approach prayer. Any any thoughts that you might have about the way we pray? Nike's got the best slogan. You just do it. Okay. No matter how how simple, how much you don't understand, it doesn't matter. God knows our heart. Just do it. Any other? Pray continuously. I don't know, that, that thought always, how do you pray continuously? I, you know, I have, a, I have things I have to do. I can't, but for me, that is, I'm driving in the car and someone comes to mind. I pray for them at that second, mm -hmm. that for a few moments. I, those, those continuous prayers mm -hmm. that you send up all the time, God, the Holy Spirit convicts you of those things to pray for at that moment. I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and can't go back to sleep. That's my prayer time sometimes yeah. to, to pray for things, for people that come to my mind. Absolutely. Prayer is more of a conversation than it is a, a speech <laughs> or an oratory. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing we started doing in our class, we, we've been really blessed to, in 1989, she started teaching senior adults. I mean, we were young then, okay? <laughs> In 1990, a men's class of 24 men, senior men, 70 and over, came to me and asked me to teach them. I said, I can't teach you guys. You know, at, at, at the time I was, you know, I was 39 years old. And I said, I can't, you guys know so much. There were former pastors in there and everything. And they talked me into it after a, a lot of persuasion. So we've been teaching a long time and we had one men's class and four ladies classes in our church when Chris came, okay? in the senior adult department. And then, you know, what, what's happened, okay? Many of them have gone on to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So when we moved to our new, we call it our new location, Chris moves us over there in 2003 to this great location we have in, in sight now. We've been there. We, we had to combine some of the senior adult classes. And then we, were, we used to be strict about the age. You need to be 68 to be in here. Now, well, that's no more. You can join any senior. We have um, like nine senior adult classes, seven that meet in the morning early before worship and two that meet wow. after worship. And so we've been teaching in one of those classes in the director of those departments for that particular one since uh, about uh, 2003, something mm -hmm. like that. And one thing we did years ago is we had a really active director. I'll try to make this briefer. She's telling me to move on here. <laughs> But anyway, her name is Margaret Stanfield. She directed our department for 25 years. And she always wanted to have a prayer list. She said, I want a prayer list from this class. We have so many needs that we can add on a list and have it on the computer, have it emailed, and have it. And we couldn't ever find anybody. I mean, it takes people to do that. You know, it didn't just happen. So we have had people in our class for 15 years. We've got somebody that does that. Yeah. And it's awesome. Yeah. We have a printout for people that need a printout every Sunday, but it's on email. And we have ca team captains. Uh, Janet and I have gone to several workshops, that are, and it's what we're doing. 
Hmm. The workshop is teaching you what to do. It just works. But when we have a prayer request, we call one of these captains. They call the main person. She gets it on a computer, and it's there that day for everybody to pray. Yeah. And it's and I, I see this class doing some of that too. And it's helped our class grow. We've had people actually join because people were praying for them. They weren't members of the class, and they've come to it. But I wanted to share that with y'all. It's one of the most powerful things that we've done, and we look forward to going every Sunday. Now, we're only teaching that one or two Sundays a month now because we've got two other teachers teaching with us. Yeah, we used to be up to 40, 45, but COVID hit us, and we're averaging 25 now. But keep in mind, there's six other classes like that at that time and two others after. So we have, on our roll, on our role in our church, we have 650 senior adults, uh, 60 wow. of, years of, or older. Wow. So it's a huge senior they adult. They still think it's program. important to get together That's and right. worship and pray. That's right. You're never too old yeah. for that. Yeah. And I'm not saying that for numbers. I'm just saying they think it's important. You know. Yeah. But awesome. prayer is what holds That's right. it yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. Amen. Everywhere. Thank you. Robert could preach a whole sermon on what we heard this last week. It was so awesome. He just rocked your boat. But oh, boy. We don't have time. You're a good, you're a good teacher. I really enjoyed being here today with all of you. Well, we're it's glad you're here. Good group. You we'll can try just to move up here if you want to. We'll, well, <laughs> <laughs> we're not having grandkids might object. <laughs> we got, we got grandkids in college station. We're not going anywhere right now. <laughs> you know, you were talking about traditions earlier. I had to snicker a little bit. You know, we do live close to Texas A&M University. Mm -hmm. And if y'all know anything about that, it's, that's what they're all about, tradition. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you've done it once, it's a tradition mm. here. So, so we thought, oh, yeah, we know about traditions. Yeah, we do. We, we, we didn't go there. <laughs> well, you know the movie that, I can't remember the name of it now, about that golf guy, but it says, respect tradition, but have a passion for the truth. I love that. I love that's that. good. Well, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that we close in prayer this morning. But our, the way we're going to pray is a little bit different because uh, Janet a minute ago was talking about, you know, how do you, how do you pray without stopping? You know, how do you pray without ceasing? And uh, I remember when years ago we were working with a group of young people because I was minister of music and youth at a church while I was in seminary for two years. Many years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, the seminary was many years ago, decades ago. But our young people in this, in this church, just they were, you know, having a prayer time, ooh, they, they just weren't into that, really. And it was very awkward. They didn't feel comfortable knowing how to pray. And we had had this book or whatever read, I can't remember now the name of the author, but it was about called Conversational Prayer. And just talking about the fact that, you know, Prayer is more like a conversation. And so we started utilizing that approach with young people and kids that had never prayed out loud started praying. And it was, uh, you know, just be like a sentence. Somebody would pray, thank you, Lord, for whatever. Lord, please help, you know, and somebody else would add. And, you know, just it was just a popcorn kind of a, of a thing. Well, what I want to get to this morning is to say I'm going to I'm going to restate as we are praying four phrases that were used in our lesson this morning. And I'm going to ask you to think of as you hear that phrase think of a person think of a group of people group of people it could be the church, it could be our leadership, it could be this class, the people in this Bible fellowship group. And just in that moment, use that phrase that I'm going to read from our lesson to pray for whoever you're thinking of. So it's going to be silent, okay? And then I'll close this at the very end after we've gone through those four phrases that I'm going to read out loud. So if you would bow in prayer, think of that person, think of that group of people. The statement was given, be steadfast.
the second phrase, be encouraged. The third phrase, be prayerful. And the fourth phrase, be confident. Dear Father, like the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. We want to continue to learn and continue to grow in our life of prayer. And help us to be ongoing, to be continuing, to be more constant, more consistent, in praying for one another. And Father, we thank you for your word that encourages us today. Help us to trust you. Help us to obey you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we have one more lesson in Second Thessalonians, and that'll be next Sunday. And I have some very special news to share with you about that. Uh, David and Judy Steverson are on the road right now. They were in Orlando this week, but they didn't fly, they drove. So he told us they would be getting in hopefully tonight. But David is going to be teaching our lesson next Sunday. So pray for him and uh, study your lesson and be ready. And uh, it's going to be a great time of fellowship. Our title is going to be Waiting. Waiting. Okay, and we'll be in chapter 3, finishing up verse 6 to 15 in chapter 3 next week. All right. Enjoy visiting with one another. How are you? Thank you. Oh, what's that? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I do not know what's going on. I don't know what's going on today. You are. I tried every setting I could think of, and nothing, nothing seemed to work. Hello? Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. Are you from there? No. Yeah. 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 Yeah.